Yeah. Good. Okay. Direct democracy, which is in reality democracy, the real thing. Instead of having representatives, the people vote for the laws. The first one is called a referendum. Some of you might have heard about this. So voters will vote on whether or not it will be a law. But it initiates. The law starts as a bill in the state assembly, the legislature. And then it goes to the voters. So a bill has to pass both the House and the Senate, because Montana has this. Not every state has all these reforms. It passes the House and the Senate, and then it'll be on the ballot in November. So would that be like the school bond for that? No, this, no, school bond is a separate, that's a that's a local election. So it goes to the state? Assembly. It goes to the assembly, so they vote in the, in the House and the Senate. If they pass it, then it goes to the voters. Yeah. And <clears throat> for example, in the state of Montana, this is actually in the state constitution, to pass a sales tax, it's got to go, it's got to pass the House and the Senate and then go to the voters. The last time that's happened was 1994, and about 70% of the people voted against it. Yeah. The today the the hierarchy of the Republican Party would like to put the sales tax back on there, but they know after that, you know, just it's they probably won't win. So that might might down the road. But that's that's sales tax. Now an initiative is another example. And the initiative gets its name from it initiates with the people. It starts with a petition. And if it gets enough signatures, then it goes on the ballot. To the voters, if it ha you have a petition process, you have to get uh, fifteen percent in another county, and then if you get that done enough registered voters in each county, then it goes to. So, what's the initiative? The initiative is if you get a bill that you get, it passes a petition, and if it gets enough people signing the petition, then it goes on the ballot, and then it becomes a law. Montana is very narrow. Both in referendum and initiative, it's got to be just one law. It can't affect a bunch of different <coughs> laws. So we have referendums or initiatives thrown out because they affected too many laws. Every state has a different rule on that, those who do. And for example, in 2006, yeah. What's the last initiative? Well, we had a lot. We, you know, we've had a lot in 2016. The most famous one in 2016 that passed was for to reform the medical marijuana laws. That was an initiative and then passed. Um, the voters pass it, and now that's law. And if you go to the primary, will anybody be 18 on the second, or the first Tuesday after the first Monday? June 5th, I think it is. No one in this class, first class. I always have one person in every other class. But if you go for the primary, they always have people outside the door before you go in to vote, and they will be asking for signatures for admissions. Always. You might see them in other places too, but that if you really notice folks they're all there to try to get all the, the right they know the registered voters because they're voting. Yeah. There was um uh, there was a girl going around for teachers to get an American Sign Language class, but that only affects like how many school districts. Yeah, that's just for the school district. Okay. And that is said to a petition, that would go to the school board and that's not the same process. And basically that would be a request. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. you know, we have enough students to say we want it. Yeah. Like between like a referendum. Well, with the referendum is usually more because it it's if they know it's something that will pass, it just has to pass the House and the Senate. You have to gather a lot of petitions and that a lot of signatures. And so you gotta to go to every county and get a bunch of signatures. So that can be really hard to do. It takes a lot of organizing. But if it's something pretty controversial, sometimes that might be the only way to get it done. And so if you go next, um, will there be, there's always some on these. You see them on the street. When I was in Portland, I was asked to sign petitions for, for uh, initiatives for Oregon. Same thing? Yeah. Said, I'm not a citizen here. And one person said, it's okay. We just want names. I don't think you understand how it works. Do you have to be a registered voter? Yeah. To have to be, no, not so much a registered voter, but you have to be a, an adult citizen of the state. Oh. 
<laughs> well, actually, every state has different rules on this. Because we, like, we, because we, um, we signed one, but we, we were like, do you have to be a registered voter? And they were like, you should be. And we were like, well, we're, we're not 18. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's it's a big deal. They have to go through and count every name. Yeah. So you could just go down to the state like Georgia or Florida and sign a petition for the You have to be a registered Yeah, in the state. And one more thing I should add. For president, convention still chose the nominees for the Democrats until 1968, even though most states have gone to primaries for other races. And the Republicans, the last year for convention was 72. And now it's more primaries and a little more formalized, one called a caucus. But the whole idea was to get more power, more people energized in voting with the idea is they'll feel like they have a greater voice. And therefore, more voter participation, more people active in the system. Did that work? No. It was a complete failure. On the goal to get voters to feel more energized, it did the exact opposite. It was an unintended consequence. And you could argue each of these are good on their merits, good programs. You could also find detractors, but you could find that's good. But together, when the goal was to weaken the political parties, Voter turnout dropped every election for the next 70 years. To where today, for the presidential election in 2016, barely 50%, just, just a little bit over 50% of all the eligible voters voted. And for the midterm election, the last one we had was in 2014, it was less than one third of the eligible voters. That means you have a significant number of people who, for whatever reason feels their vote doesn't matter it's not worth it and i left out of the system and got to be clear about this this benefits some people if others don't vote so this is a big deal why did it happen why did all these things lead to voter turnout dropped why did that happen so basically what we're saying is just that fewer fewer and fewer people have a great control over this country and this is I can't even begin to tell you what a big deal this is, especially when you get to reapportionment of seats for the House and the Senate. This is like, can change everything. Or laws on who can vote and not vote and make it difficult, more difficult to vote. Yeah. What party for usually doesn't vote? I mean, where are these the last Both are relatively, uh, relatively equal. What happens is both parties are incredibly weak. What happened is this has resulted in, the biggest reason was severely weakened political parties in the United States. Today, both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are extremely weak parties, at least as a functioning party in a political system. And the Republicans are probably slightly better or more organized than the Democrats, but still both are really weak as a way a party should function. Now, and you can tell because if they ask people about their voter ID, more people say they're Democrats than Republicans. <coughs> But the plurality says that they're independent. And if people say they're independent, that's a <laughs> weak party system. Weak, weak, weak. And so you see about the party differences in the House and the Senate. Once you leave those chambers, the parties become weaker and weaker out in the public. So we're not, let's say, like England or Germany or places like that. And for lots of reasons, but this was the goal. And what happened is with the weakened parties, you don't get these functions. The parties get out the vote. <laughs> the parties go door to door to get out the vote. You know, they, they go and say, you got to go vote. Let's go uh, get together and, uh, or they'll get buses or all kinds of things to get people to the ballot box. They'll remind you. That process now just simply, at least it's not face to face anymore. Next, voters, the parties educate. The parties will tell you, we're for these things, so you vote for the Republicans, we stand for this. Or you vote for the Democrats, we stand for this. Now, because we have winner-take-all in two-party system, it's going to be a little vague because our parties have to be so big. You know, a system like Germany, where you have a lot more parties, you know, you can really stand up for certain things in the parties. You don't have to be quite as broad. But still, that education process is very vague. For the most part, if somebody says there's a Republican or a Democrat, you really don't know what they stand for. You get a little bit of an idea, kind of a, but it's pretty vague. 
And if you're not really paying attention, you get really numb. And that is a serious problem. If you don't really understand the real differences, then what's the choice and why vote? And lastly, party ID gives an indicator on who to vote for. It would be nice if you lived in a society where everyone had the time and the knowledge and the ability to go through information and pick the best voters for all these different races, but most people can't. Either they don't have the knowledge, you don't have the capability, you know, things like that, but for the most part, people are really busy. You know, they work full time, they have families, there's a lot of things going on. So I have time to go through every single race. The parties give you some kind of indication of the vote for. Okay, I'm not sure about the race for comptroller general, but okay, I know what a Republican stands for, I vote for a Republican. Or I don't know what a Democrat, just get my point on that. If you don't really know, it's harder to vote. You notice I said comptroller general. We actually don't have one, but it's just such a great position. Yeah, and a lot of states have a comptroller general, they basically handle the budget. A little bit similar to our, our uh, um, state auditor, uh, which you might know what they do. A lot of times people running for state auditor me don't even know what they do. So the point is, this is hard. And the parties did this. If the parties are weakened, there's going to be a big vacuum. Who will do it? And stepping in the vacuum, why this was so important, it was unintended in a way but the way the progressives were made up in that first iteration of the progressives back at this time, it kind of made sense. In the vacuum, very narrow interest groups. And you could argue the progressives were kind of an interest group. You'll see this <laughs> as they started having campaign finance laws. Some of you might have heard of a political action committee or a PAC. That's where that term comes from, a narrow interest group to represent a relatively narrow field. Remember the Grange? That was a farmer's interest group. You might get labor unions, uh, conservation or environmental groups. You might get business. And this could be all different realms of business. You know, the steering manufacturers, the small business. You go, you call it to all kinds of business. Little, very particular interest groups. And you could have probably the biggest are the banking, the different banking interest groups. And there's more. I'm just giving you a very narrow look at this. But they step in. And the thing about it is, unlike political parties, except for maybe labor unions, but labor unions are pretty weak now, uh, their power isn't the number of people who support it. I mean, to be honest, there's not going to be millions and millions of people who are saying, we need uh, less banking regulations. So what's their power come from? What do they provide that gives them their power and influence over politicians? Exactly. When the interest groups step in, that meant money became even more important. That's supposed to be a dollar sign. And that's how they made dollar signs back in the progressive era. Few people know that. That'll be on the test. But a line and a dollar sign. There. That's even worse. But I already told you about, you know, remember 1840 on image and that log cabin campaign? And then in 1896, how money, well, that was the first one where money really mattered, you get your voice out. <coughs> now it's even more important. And what they can do is they can influence politicians through money. And who are they going to listen to then? A bunch of individual voters who are independent or the people with the checks? And the point about that is if the people with the checks become more important, if you're a regular voter, wouldn't it be easy to think, my vote doesn't matter, all they care about is them, why vote? It doesn't matter. Why even pay attention? Nothing I want will ever happen, why vote? Which by the way, if people think that way, who does that help? These people. Yeah. yeah. If people don't vote, they have more influence. So it's kind of a really corrosive cycle that begins to happen and people lose interest as flawed as parties are they give this kind of general uh id to what they stand for and give people a little bit of control you know i'm a i'm a republican so i know if i vote for republicans i know what they stand for if they don't do it they're going to lose our vote instead we just kind of have three agents in fact 
it, it's a pretty amazing. It shows how weak parties are when you get politicians bragging about how they'll work with the other party. We can argue whether or not that's good or bad, but that's a sign of a really weak party. That's really a sign of a weak party. You wouldn't see that kind of stuff in England. If a, if a Tory said that about working with the Labour Party, they'd be out of the party tomorrow. No, this is what you stand for, and we voted for you for that reason. So, this is a big deal. And this is part, I, no doubt about it, this, it was the unintended consequences of making parties. And there are some corrupt measures of the party that kind of hurt that. And the thing about it was, is that this is going to be the time when we get the last thing we got to talk about, national progressives. On the national level, and the thing about national level, remember the Commerce Clause. Because of the Commerce Clause, they have real power. And in 1901, there's a president that looks like he might be a progressive, the one that Marcus Hanna was so afraid of, and so was J.P. Morgan and John Rockefeller. Who was the president? Teddy Roosevelt. He likes his initials. His, his uh, distant cousin, who admired him greatly, would copy that, even though he was a Democrat and was a Republican, FDR. And then some Democrats would all copy FDR for a long time. That's where you get all the initials. Teddy Roosevelt. Now, Roosevelt claimed to be a progressive, or I'm sorry, at first claimed he was not a progressive, but sympathized with him. But by 1905, he was a progressive. Yes? What does it say for low national? Commerce. Because of that commerce clause, that's where the progressive regulations can have real effect. Remember, the government regulates interstate commerce, and that gives them immense power. And so, the big things about Roosevelt you have to get is that he would do a couple things to be relatively fair to labor unions for the first time, and also talk about breaking up trust. But for his first three years as president, he really pushed for no major progressive reforms. So for men like J.P. Morgan, they looked at it like, we can work with this guy. He talks a good show, but he doesn't deliver. In fact, Marcus Hanna was the only one who said, hey, I gotta, I'm got i going to run against him. But then he passed away before he could actually run. And so for the first three years, he was dominated by, remember, the Dominican Republic, the Roosevelt Corollary, uh, Venezuela, Panama Canal, things outside the frame of the United States. So the election of 1904 is when Teddy Roosevelt would really show that he was a progressive president. And it would be these things that he would lump together in the 1904 election as his square deal. He gave it a name. Now remember the Democrats and the Republicans kind of did that in 1896 with the silver bug and the gold <laughs> bug thing? But here was a set progressive program. And it is very much like the Ohio platform of the populists. And think about it, square deal. Sounds good, doesn't it? I don't know what Roosevelt really stands for, but he's gonna give me a square deal. It's something you can stick to. And future presidents would do that, take that. His cousin would be best known for partially by accident, but copying the square deal. What would his be? The New Deal. The New Deal. Harry Truman would be the fair deal. Eisenhower would be dynamic conservatism. Ruining. Kennedy, New Frontier. Lyndon Johnson, Great Society. You go all the way to President Obama had hope and change. What does that even mean? Right? And then what did President Trump add, copying President Reagan? Make America great. What does that mean? It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. It gives you something. Now, for the slogan, for the use as advertising, this was a progressive platform. And this was going to have major reforms. To give you an idea how broad this was, taking many of the same ideas that the progressives have. The first one, eight-hour workday. Eight-hour workday. And the thing about eight-hour workday, <coughs> that lowers wages. You need a third more workers with an eight-hour workday. Yeah. Eight hours Huh? Yeah, Depends what president. <laughs> you know, Ronald Reagan put in a solid one or two hours a day, so Calvin Coolidge. 
uh, President Carter put in a solid 30 to 40 hours a day. <laughs> yeah, he about killed himself working. And, and how much you work doesn't necessarily mean how effective you are, but uh, also workers comp, you know what that is? Yeah, big reform. Also an old age pension that would be soon known as social security. And child labor laws. There'll be other workplace safety laws, but I just give you a big example of these. Did he get these, by the way? Yes. No. He pushed it, made them an issue. He wanted them. None of this would happen until what president? His cousin, Franklin Roosevelt. And today, Social Security is one of the most popular notes. One of the most popular and most successful government programs. And if you don't believe me, ask anybody who's getting your retirement age. And they will tell you how important it is. Like if you're within 10 years, I, I'm going to throw someone at you. Me. <laughs> important old age pension. A lot of people argue that it's not a benefit. It's not what? A lot of people argue that Social Security is an effect. Is it an effect? Is it effective? Didn't you say it was No, I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't provide full pension. It's probably not big enough. Oh. But it's still better than what it was before. Okay. The poverty, uh, I'll talk about the we get to ask for the law about Social Security. Okay. But he wanted these, they didn't pass. There are more things he wanted, but I just want to give you an idea how broad his reform was. Oh, and suffrage too. And that would not be till the end of the progressive era. What amendment would that be? We're going to just barely mention uh, suffrage in this unit because it was such a big deal at the end of World War I into the 1920s, that's when I really talk about what happened with how, suff how the, the uh, Susan B. Anthony Amendment was passed. And one more thing, he didn't talk about it, but a lot of them wanted prohibition as a major reform. The temperance movement was growing in strength, but in reality, Roosevelt wanted more just controls of alcohol but that would snowball because of the war, and that's where you get the 18th Amendment. Once again, we'll talk about that more when we get to the 1920s. That kind of makes sense when we talk about prohibition. But let's get to a few more things. Yeah. So this unit, hmm? this unit is like we'll go up to 1960 for the most part. And then we'll kind of go backtrack a little bit because we have to go to World War I next. And then a few more things, though. Roosevelt would want. <laughs> a progressive income tax. Also an inheritance tax, but I'll talk about that more when we get to Franklin Roosevelt. And it did not pass while he was president, but the ball got rolling for lots of reasons, and that's when the 16th Amendment would happen, allowing for an income tax. It'd be 1913. So actually this is when Woodrow Wilson just became president, boom. Like the sound effect? Direct election of senators. This is a big deal. The Square Deal was this all-encompassing program. Very much like the Omaha platform. It'd be very much like what's going to happen in the New Deal. And we get our own amendment for that. 1913, the 17th Amendment. There's still some people, um, politically, they're pretty conservative. Economically, they're pretty <laughs> conservative. We want to get rid of that. They still, every once in a while, bring that up of what a disaster it was. They're usually the same people also say that the 19th Amendment was a mistake. And also, another one he wanted was more regulation. He would get some of that as president. We already talked about the FDA. Remember that, the Meat Inspection Act after the jungle? But also, a big one was the Hepburn Act. Along with the Elkins Act, we only care about the Hepburn Act in here, that would strengthen the Interstate Commerce Commission. Remember, that was the body to regulate railroad rates. It didn't do a very effective job on it. Hepburn, give it some teeth. And he would have some success in antitrust. In fact, he would get a nickname. Even though it didn't break up that many, you know what his nickname would be? 
The Trust Buster. That's an awesome word. He was the first president to use the Sherman Antitrust Act for what it was meant to be used for. Even though it was still a weak law, and he had some success. And the big thing about that was when he started, and actually it'd be finished under Taft, where they forced John Rockefeller to break up the Standard Oil Company and sell off assets, <coughs> this was quite a message. Companies realize we can't get too big or we will be broken up. This would cut down on the pressure to get too big. Okay, as soon as there's a president who wasn't progressive, then it all, the merger mania began again in the 20s. One thing though Roosevelt said, Standard Oil was a bad trust. They used their power to manipulate the markets. They literally had just tried to take over all the oil that's out of Kansas and the soon to be state of Oklahoma. They made it so you could only sell to them. That's exciting, does not it? And that would kind of initiate this. So bad trust break up. But Roosevelt did have a caveat. Good trusts are more efficient and will keep those. Yay, I can't, why can't I make a star anymore? That was going to be a star, and that's what it came out as. Kind of wish I could do that little symbol again. It's kind of cool. Good trust. Good trusts are more efficient. What is that term? For the bigger you are, your costs drop and you become more efficient. Your economies of scale. So think about it in terms of, let's say, a utility company that does electricity. Does it make sense to have five different public utilities with their own big uh, you know, coal-powered electrical facility or hydroelectric dam, all with five separate sets of wires trying to go into every neighborhood in Helen? No. It's much more efficient to have one. Or for that matter, even for something like cars, think how expensive it would be to make a, car, a factory, the assembly, the brand new assembly line that's come to produce cars. If you have a bunch of different car companies doing it, that means the price of all these smaller companies that have to charge would be pretty high. A few companies, much more efficient, and what happens to the price of the consumers? Technically goes down. And Hmm? Oh, sure. And that's why I said good trusts are good, but they must be regulated. And that's so they can't do that. By the way, who decides what a good trust is and a bad trust? Teddy Roosevelt. And the problem with that is once the president starts giving himself this kind of power, okay, if you like Roosevelt, you're saying, great, I'm so glad that that power is in the hands of Teddy Roosevelt. But what if you hate the next president? Yet they have that power that Teddy Roosevelt took. That's the problem is the presidents get more power. And so, last thing then, <coughs> for this, square deal is a big deal, have you noticed? And we'll bring this back, one more thing. He was also the first major president, the first president to really make a, an emphasis on conservation. And he was greatly influenced by the naturalist John Muir. Here's a guy who saved Yosemite. You have no idea how close it came to damning Yosemite. You have no idea how close it came to damning the canyons of, of Grand Canyon. They almost damned the, the canyon. Um, the Yellowstone, many different places in Yellowstone National Park. So close. But. The idea of conservation is a little bit different than you might think environmentalism that's going to develop more into the late 50s and early 60s. And they were about dams too. But this is more as natural resources became used up really quick, especially trees by this time. About 97% of the natural forests have been cut down at least once in the continent of the United States. And the realization hit that if we keep at this pace, we'll run out. Or of other resources, we're going to run out. And Roosevelt was thinking not just for the trees themselves, but he wants forests and wilderness because that's where animals live, and he desperately wants to shoot them tomorrow. And if we get rid of the forest today, what will he shoot tomorrow? You. He very much wanted to go hunting. That was his big deal. And so the conservation would be to conserve it for future use. 
So for example, the Forest Service would be created. Also the National Park Service would become an independent branch. But the Forest Service is part of the Agriculture Department. Hard, save trees to harvest them later. And probably the most important, with the longest last impact in the West, was the Reclamation Act. And this was to reclaim arid and dry land in the, in the United States, meaning where we live. You have to conserve all this water that was running out to the ocean and not the sea and disappearing. That was his conservation idea. How do you conserve water that's running out to the ocean? How do you stop it? You build dams. And the reclamation program will be, the Recl Reclamation Act will be the biggest dam building program ever. Especially when the New Deal hit Franklin Roosevelt. But by the 1960s, virtually every place, except for a few, just very few, that's good for a dam in the continental United States has a dam right now. There's almost no place left except for a few places like Yosemite National Park and a few others. Huh? There's not going to be any new places on the Yellowstone. Only a couple places on the, in the National Park. Most places you can't build a dam. They don't work. 74, they found that out when the Teton Dam went out and killed hundreds of people in Iowa. They built it on limestone. So, that's Roosevelt's success, but here's the deal. Roosevelt and the Square Deal easily defeated the nondescript Democrat who ran against him. He's so nondescript that nobody remembers him. Alton Parker. That's a, yeah, good. That's what people said then, too. Nobody wanted to run against Roosevelt. Well, the problem was, men like J.P. Morgan and, and Rockefeller gave Roosevelt a lot of money, assuming this was all just talk. Roosevelt meant it. He took their money and said, I'm still going to do what I think is right. But they got the last laugh. Roosevelt would have liked to run for president again. No way would they let him run. No way. And then in 1907, there would be a panic. Presidents are always, your presidents always get a little bit too much credit for good economic times, a little bit too much blame for bad economic times. This was not as bad as 93, but it was a bad panic. Roosevelt could not run for re-election. I should add, and the textbook does mention, in 1904, it's kind of a campaign ploy. He said, I will not run again. One term. And let for the next man. And then he immediately regretted it. Why did I do that? I love being president. He's not done, though. He would turn it over in 1908 to his hand-picked successor, this is Republican, William Howard Taft, who would defeat William Jennings Bryan. The last time Bryan will run, 1908. But Roosevelt was immediately furious <coughs> and thought that Taft went against his conservation principles and never pushed for the square deal. He thought Taft let him down. So Roosevelt, who went on a safari to Africa, he was really worried that most of the big game, big game animals would be killed before he had a chance to kill them. It, it, it just, the logic always kind of makes me laugh. But, and I like tigers. I used to have one. Actually, they're not tigers, they're pretty lions. I was there a lot. <coughs> he, by 1910, did I say 1910? <laughs> by 1910, was furious with Taft. And he threatened to run again. In fact, he announced a new, more expanded square deal program that he would call. Well, let's, I'll say that. Because in 1912 will be one of the most exciting elections where you're going to get two progressives running, Taft and a socialist. And all four were exceedingly popular. 1912 election. Roosevelt tried to barnstorm his way to the Republican convention in Philadelphia, and he was not allowed in the door. The most popular politician in America, the Republicans would not have him, because they're still mad about the square deal stuff. And so, Taft got the nomination, and, and Roosevelt announced, well, I'm throwing my hat in the ring. You ever heard that term? He made it up. And he joined the very small progressive party. 
And when he was asked after he announced he would run for president under this brand new third party, he said, you know, they asked him, how do you feel, Mr. President? Once you're president, you're always address that. He said, I feel as fit, and he liked to beat his chest. So I feel as fit as a bull moose. That's the bull moose party. Now, we are a little bit behind because all of you showing up late, so I'm blaming you. No. Wait, wait, wait. On that list, let me get this down really quick, okay? I know the bell rang. Woodrow Wilson would be the Democrat. This is like 1860, isn't it? And his program would be called New Freedom. And we would have Eugene Debs, the socialist, who was very popular. But the Democrats would win because Republicans were split. And the last thing we have to get is this. Or I'm going to tell you. On that list, the list of terms. Can be yeah. I'm sorry I did not get to the Federal Reserve Act and down. The last four. Please just know that. Well, I already mentioned what you need to know about the 19th Amendment. Wilson was the most racist president in American history. So no civil rights at all. And I'm, so I'm going to talk more about that in the 20s. And lastly, know what the Clinton Antitrust Act and the Federal Reserve Act is. Yeah, Wilson won. Because the Republicans were split. How? Hmm? How are the Republicans split? Because Roosevelt's a Republican. Yes, he was a Republican, but just for one election, he became the bull. Yeah, so it's usually three to four soldiers. What we do is three to four soldiers. Explain what it is. Define the terms. Give me what it is. And then. So they get turns up like the triple. That would lead to the food and drug act in the inspection. So show how it related to something else. Oh, thank you. For your birthday, you kids this. Oh, thank you. Happy birthday. You skipped yesterday. Yes. So what do you want to do? Like, I can take the test. Sure, yeah. but oh, the the shirt. So on my left page, I'll go to Were you sick or? Um, I had a.